Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Hello. Hey. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm accompanied today by Sudanshu, our head of product for GoFood, um, and Abinit, our head of design uh, in Gojek. And today, very special topic of discussion, something I feel personally very uh, strong about as a topic that I think a lot of people misunderstand is design. What is design? There's so many books on design. Uh, there's so many buzzwords related to design thinking. Um, I think the very definition of what is a designer is, is, is gray at best. So one of my biggest fundamental questions is what is design and is it a science or is it an art? Uh, you can add another question to that. Is it engineering? Is it engineering? Yes, with software design, that also comes up. Interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, where do we start? Um, short answer, it's none of the above. <laughs> it's none of the above. <laughs> yes. Design is design. Uh, it's existed for a long time now. Um, a lot of people confuse design, designers in general with artists. So uh, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine as well. A lot of people would come to you uh, for example, somebody came the other day and they were showing the work of some illustrator and they were saying, this guy, like, these illustrations are amazing. Uh, this guy can be a designer in your team, right? And that really, really annoys me. Why uh, is that? Because, Why did that annoy you? Uh, because art and design are really very different. Like, that they, they have absolutely different purpose. And at some level, it's unfair to the artists as well. Hold on a second. I think yeah. a lot of people will be offended by that comment. A lot of artists slash designers would be offended at that comment sure. because for a lot of artists, you know, their purpose, uh, they have a strong purpose as well. They're not just, sure. you know, creating impressionist art in their garage. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you say that? Why, why do you say it's, it's different? What is the difference of the purpose of an artist and a designer? So, uh, the biggest difference between art and design or artist or designer is a designer needs a brief. Mm. So art exists for, people have argued about this for a long time. I think some philosophers said that art is a reflection of real life, but even like, that's also controversial today. Sure. Does it need to be? So basically art doesn't need to be anything. Uh, art's value is judged in terms of either its beauty or its emotional effect on people. Right. So, for example, um, this guy, Piero Manzoni or something, I'm getting the name wrong for sure. The guy who basically put, uh, took, you know, 90 cans of Campbell's soup, shat in it, and put it in an <laughs> exhibition. Uh, he decided the value of uh, it by pegging it to gold then. <laughs> uh, that's, that's art. Or... There's this documentary called The Artist is Present, like uh, Maria Abramovich. She basically stood in MoMA uh, and shared a moment of silence with people, and it profoundly affected the people that were there. Um, whereas design, you, like, art is really different. Design is not like that. Like, I was watching this documentary by uh, Hayazaki, right? Mm. And that guy is an artist, right? So in the documentary, he's like... You know, he was really worried that his opening for his new movie, his catching things and throwing them away, uh, that the opening for his movie would be really, you know, conventional. Mm. You don't want your designer saying that, right? He, he's like, I don't have the details, but I want to make a movie which is happy and fun. You don't want your designer saying that. Mm. Like, designers exist to let whoever, if you design an object, if you design a product or a service, uh, the person at the other end of it 
should be able to accomplish that task. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Is it the right word than functional design? So b- by default, if someone is designing something yeah. or they are a designer, mm-hmm. there needs to be a function that is being used by an end user yes. within that. There needs to be a brief that exists, right? So, and again, like it's difficult to separate these two because there are a lot of artists as well, famous artists, who would hate getting commissions mm. because uh, then you have to figure in the needs of the person who's commissioning the art and your self-expression becomes secondary. Mm. Uh, then there's another problem of there is art in everything. So there's art in engineering as well. Mm-hmm. There's art in science. Art is everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say a good designer takes care of the function. Uh, you can't always have zero you know, self-expression in the product. I think some of the products that I've designed, we've designed, there's a part of us that's there. Of course. But at no point should it get in the way of you know, meeting what the brief that's requires right. you to meet. So self-expression is only okay if it does not conflict with the brief, yes. the objective yes. of the function yes. that you are serving. Mm. So Seems less sexy of a job than an artist. Yes, exactly. Like it's, it's not as sexy as art is. And in fact, like, yeah, unless you look at designer salaries, then probably <laughs> <laughs> a better professional choice than being an artist. But otherwise, it's not sexy. Do you have a different definition, <coughs> Sudanshu? I mean, you're, you are... Uh, you're you're a pseudo designer, you know, in some ways yes. because you've run design companies before, but you've moved on to the much more vague world of product management. Exactly. And you are, you know, you are a a, a one of the most if not the most senior product guy, you know, in in the organization running a a massive food business. So do you agree with Abinit's definition of design and designer? So I think I agree to quite an extent. By When we say design, I think what we specifically mean is user experience design. Hmm. There are a lot of different types of design which focus at very different types of you know final results. What we talk about as design is usually user experience. Now, uh, what do you need for a good user experience? You want someone who understands the medium very well. If you make apps, you need to know what does iOS do, what does Android do. If you make websites, you need to know what do browsers do, what can be done, what can't be done. Mm -hmm. And you need to keep the end user in mind, which means whoever, if it's a B2B product, you figure out who is, like, when they made Slack, they figured out who the end user is, what do they want to do, Mm. which is why Slack's design was so uh, at home when it came out compared to other products at that time. Uh, If it's a B2C product, then you're thinking of that user, And you want to make sure that your users, we sort of talked about this before, can be as lazy as they can Mm -hmm. while they use their product. Because assumption is no one will really want to spend any time on it until it takes the least amount of time. So you have to make sure great design assumes the user is incredibly lazy and may not want to use your service if they don't have to. Yes. If they don't have to. And that should be the fundamental hypothesis where design begins, Yes, especially in UX and apps. I just want to go back a little bit. You mentioned something pretty interesting. You mentioned that one of the first important criteria of being a good designer, especially a UX designer or a user experience designer, is, especially for mobile apps or for any software, is they have to understand the domain knowledge of software engineering itself, right? They don't need to be an engineer. Yep. But they have to so is the good analogy is like if you have an, inter- imagine an interior designer that knows nothing about architecture, mm-hmm. right? You got an interior designer that just knows things that are beautiful, uh, but doesn't understand how the durability of the materials yes, go, exactly. the user flows within the house, indoor, outdoor, uh, tear and wear and user flows. Exactly. For example, uh, if you are an interior designer, uh, how? So, for example, if I'm making this office, yeah. one of the things you would consider is, uh, will there be a lot of echo, right? Mm. The medium of whatever you are doing is very critical to understand because without it, the solutions that you come out with might be non-optimal. 
Mm. Again, you don't have to know it as well as an engineer on the team. Mm-hmm. Sure, but you need to understand your constraints. Uh, and I think dealing and making sure that you can solve for those constraints is what makes really good designers. Mm. And yeah, this is a controversial topic again. Uh, there's a should designers code meme on the internet going around for at least a decade. Should and designers code? Yeah, and it annoys a lot of designers and for the right reason. Um, and yeah, designers shouldn't code, but what he said is right. You should understand the medium. If I'm going to a designer, let's say a furniture designer, I want a beautiful table. That guy should know his, you know, what wood to use, uh, what is, you know, the structural you know, strength capacity for a wood to be able to make a structure this big. It mm-hmm. doesn't need four supports or three. So understanding the re- the the medium is really important. Probably not as well as the carpenter. Wait, wait. You don't know how to but, actually. But if he doesn't know, yeah. so if that interior designer is focused on furniture and yeah. doesn't understand the basic pro- principles of carpentry, yeah. then the cost could be way too yes. high. Yes. That is outside of the budget yes. of the owner. Yes. And then the the weight and the fitting, the structural integrity of it might just break. Yes. Like a chair. Yes. It's yeah. a beautiful chair, but it breaks. Yes. Is that what you're what you're saying about the the domain? Yes. Or uh, he or she might not be able to deliver as good a design as say some other designer who really does understand the medium really well. Mm. Right. So it's really important to understand the medium. If you're an industrial designer, you better understand metals and other materials and their properties and their manufacturing processes and costs. Uh, if you're a software designer or a UX designer, you better understand the medium. Um, another thing is like the definition of design keeps expanding. Yeah. Uh, it's a really new profession. Uh, almost every time I see a discussion on say at Twitter or somewhere else about design, it basically devolves to somebody trying to define design again. Um, so as the meaning expands, uh, more and more designers can get away in tech companies uh, without knowing too much about software because now services are expanding. We need to take care of the customer service side. We need to take care of the operation side. Mm -hmm. So you can get away. There are roles in tech companies where you can get away with knowing less about software as a medium. Um, But the closer you get to the machines, you need to understand it to be able to design great solutions. Mm. I mean, for example, we've been talking about this for a while to start off with service design. Um, Service design is different. so f- I'll give you an example. Uh, we have sales teams who reach out to merchants and onboard them. Mm-hmm. And merchants can do three, four different things on our platform. Mm-hmm. They can figure Mer- out how just, to grow. Just for the listeners, merchants means restaurants. Merchants means restaurants. Yeah, that, so. that are trying yes. to sell their food online yes. through the GoFood platform. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, when someone in the sales team reaches out to a restaurant and says, come on board our platform, mm-hmm. From the time that they agree, or rather from the time that they reach out for the first time to the point that they show up on the platform for the first time. It can be a software experience. It can be an out of software experience as well. However, you need someone to solve for how is that experience the smoothest. That is what we call service design. And we've been trying to figure out how do you start off? I mean, how do you start off with solving this area of it? Because if you don't, uh, we have a tremendous number of people, uh, restaurants on our platform. They come in because they see the need. However, I also feel that sometimes we just assume that they will jump through whatever hoops required for them to get there. Mm-hmm. That does not need to be the case, mm-hmm. which means we need to figure out how do we make that express or I mean that process really simple for them. Uh, which goes outside of software. And again, like this is the This is the industry that we are in specifically. The biggest problem with our products is always outside of the software. I can make sure that our app shines really, really well. But if you can't find a driver, it's a waste of the user's time. Yep. So... Or, f- or have a very crappy in-ride experience. Exactly. Either in a bike, car, or your food comes cold. Yes. The stuff that is not part of that experience. So so what are you saying? Are you saying that user experience designers need to take a holistic approach to the end-to-end 
experience. Yeah. By default, it means experience, right? Yeah. Yes. And if it's part of experience. your experience yeah. is not um, interacting with the app, yeah. Yeah. for example, through your smartphone or through online, yeah. uh, through desktop, then it's still within your scope of responsibility. Yeah. And the best designers will design in a t- totality yeah. of that experience. Like That's these days, there's isn't that too much to ask from them? So well, not really. It's been happening for a lot of years. I so think service, which is yeah. why we talk about service design, yeah. in the sense that uh, when we said the definition of a UX designer, if you work on the app, you constrain the constraints of that medium. If you're doing service design, there are different constraints that you need to understand. Mm. And uh, without it, you will not be able to do a good job. So uh, it's different mediums. However, the end result is the same. You want to make sure that your user has a really good experience. Can we go back to the the reason why I keep going back to the architecture and house? (laughs) Yes. analogy is because it's such a good analogy it is, yeah. to, it is. to describe yeah. this. For a lot of people, it's such a good analogy. And going to your point, the total service um, experience instead of just UX defined by me tapping around in an app, yeah. right? But the whole experience from when, I, when it pops up in my head, I need food, yes. all the way to the food is in front of my face and I'm eating it. Okay. Exactly. That is the totality of the experience. Somebody, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I just finish my, my yeah, house yeah, analogy? Hold on, hold on. Sure. Let me finish my house. So the equivalent would be is if a table designer, okay, an interior designer, again, drew out a, a gorgeous, you know, um, you know, dining table that was made of all this expensive and beautiful thing. But then forgot to ask the user whether or not they actually have dinner at home. Do they have friends over yes. a lot? Where do you work? Do you travel a lot, right? Do you have a culture or a habit of having breakfast with your kids? What's the average number of people you eat with at home? Yes. Do you even eat at home? Yes. Like if you're going and sitting down, do you work in your dining table? Yeah. These experiences that are beyond the using of that table, yeah. but the flow of that human and their habit and behavior, that's, a, that's somewhat yes. of an analogy. Yeah. You have to see it holistically. There's an there's a industry standard term for when you make something look good, but it does not really work. It's called lipstick on a pig. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and what I was saying was like, just to make it clear for people like the difference between product and a service the there's this saying that the user does not want a nine inch drill bit the user wants a nine inch hole in their wall Mm. right so that's kind of what design does and what you were asking earlier was is it too much to ask designers to do that and designers have been doing this for a really long time Mm. maybe not in software but before that you brought up service design service design is coined by some guy some banker somewhere before that, he wanted to improve the efficacy of the service that uh, they provide to their customers. I'm assuming it would be time for waiting in the lounge and things like that. This used to be the domain of marketing or management. Mm-hmm. And then it came out on its own and became service design. And people have been designing services, for example, automobile service centers. Right? They have to design the service. They experience where would the customers come? Mm-hmm. Uh, how long would it take? How do you communicate to them that you're you know, vehicle is ready for pickup. So we've been doing complicated service design. That's right. And if you look at... Back in the day, those were called ops managers, by the way. Operations managers. Which today is such... It seems like such a different thing. You know, you just have to deal with real world stuff. But actually, before the online world took over, operations managers were designers. Yes. They were the ones designing every part of that, like the bank experience when you go to a bank, what's the next flow, et cetera, like that, right? Um, And they're just doing this. It's just that now so many more interactions are being taken online to the software space, and therefore we've created this then new species of designers. You were going to say about the rise of designers. Yeah. Tell, tell your story about how no one wanted to talk to you because you were a designer. I think that was, yeah. that was really good. Yeah, so <laughs> I think uh, we, I, I was lucky to be around the 2007. I started working around that time. 
that was when the iPhone launched as well, right? So, does yeah. Before that, like so me and Sanju used to go to meetings with clients, and if you introduce me as the say he's the CTO, you get to ask why, right? The why questions. They would we need to build this for this. And like, you're a bank, and we need this app, and people need so to. So he this. lied and told people you were the CTO. I actually was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, so you are. But, yeah, but, but but you had to be introduced as the CTO, or else no one would listen. Yeah, to you. and then we started. Then I, we started doing design. Uh, more seriously, then we would go to meetings, and he would introduce me as a designer, and yeah, people wouldn't expect me to. There were, in fact, some people who said, like, "Why do we need a designer here in the meeting? Like, <laughs> designers should start when we we haven't even decided what to build yet." <laughs> I was like, "That's exactly when you should talk to a designer." Right? <laughs> so it took us some time to understand. This to, is to, how long ago? This is two thousand seven, two thousand eight. And how has this changed now? You mentioned the rise of designers. So what happened? Was it, yeah. was it Johnny Ives that just made design so sexy I and a lot of high value? Happened. I think it really. So again, you have to go far back, like starting from ergonomics uh, to 1940s, 50s when the industrial age came in. Toyota. I remember reading the Toyota way, and um, these guys had a human-centered production. Where they were the first ones to optimize not for just you know the output of the assembly line, but for the happiness and well-being of the workers themselves. The workers there could actually stop the assembly line as well if they had a structural or process improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where it started. Then GUI happened in 70s, 80s. Uh, that's when Don Norman coined the word UX. Uh, S- parallelly in non-industrial uh, or software things, people were doing architecture. And other things were coming up with philosophies and processes as well, mm-hmm. but I think it all came around to 1990s or something uh, when Facebook launched. That was the first thing that changed. Was I think Moore's law stopped giving, mm. so technology became more accessible. Mm-hmm. And when computing power was same, I think the user experience became the differentiator. Mm-hmm. With all these websites by 2000s, I think we had web products. Uh, we remember 37 signals. They yeah. they came around 2006, 7, mm. I think. Um, so I websites think. happened, web apps happened. Uh, you remember webmasters? There were there, there were roles called webmasters. People who they would be the sysadmins, but they would also design the website. Uh, then there were web designers, uh, sort of like engineers as well as mm-hmm. developers, um, engineers as well as designers. And from there, I think. OS has improved, design kept improving and became a thing. But eventually, when the mobile phone came out, that's when I the think the smartphone. It, yeah, the smartphone yes. came out. That's when it exploded. I think iPhones it couldn't copy paste, right? It had a software keyboard. Uh, it you couldn't install apps on it until I think 2009, right? So people really yeah, yeah. the App Store came two years or three years later. So what do we do? What do we have before? I remember you had six apps. Oh, uh, you had was the it. calculator. Yeah. You could calculate <laughs> stuff. You couldn't download an app. No, but you could jailbreak. So there, it was just like a call. I don't remember that. I think I had the next version. Yeah, of that iPhone 2G didn't have that yeah. for so, about a year, two years. So th- this is. The, tell me if my hypothesis is wrong on this. Yeah. My theory is that the reason why design and what we know today as user experience design, some people call it. And there's many for some people it means material design or yeah. app design. Yeah. Some people call it human design. We have a whole thing. Yeah, a, yeah. So this came out from this constraint yes. of a space this big, <laughs> this small. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, human centered design, etc. IDEO, Adaptive Path. These companies had done work. Yeah. Uh, a lot of work uh, to bring these terms to the fore. Even design thinking came from IDEO. So there was some work there. No, but, but now yeah. this the sheer number of yes. users yes. that were using yes. the same product. Yes. I don't care if it's online or offline. Yes. Because of smartphones, the number of people using that same product. Like how many people use like the same exact mug? Like yes. probably none, yes. right? Yes. It's very yes. small. But everyone started using the same product when the mobile the rise of the mobile apps. Yes. And so every little incremental improvement you did to it faced vast yes. impact and consequences yes. for people. And so design, like all great design, comes from a constraint, yes. yep. a need. Yeah. And the constraint was space. Yeah. And when space became a constraint, you suddenly saw the, the rise of, 
I wouldn't say minimalist design, but but deeply, um, I don't know. I don't know how to even describe it. It was less is more. Yes. And and because of that, the science behind it and uh, the the amount of knowledge that had to be applied and research and experimentation exploded. Yeah. Because you you can't put everything in the same yes. screen. Also, remember, like uh, I remember, the first two years, three years of the App Store, uh, almost every app that we worked on had a price to it. These weren't apps which were giving you know uh, companies which are giving you apps for free and giving you services. Mm. Most of the early apps were paid apps, right? Ah. So when you put a five dollar amount on your app, then it has to be better than every other five dollar. Yes. Right. So design did become a big differentiator. Plus, iPhone 2G was on edge, so the internet what, was yet to come. Wouldn't in. that be even more acute if the, if the apps were free? Uh probably. You're basically it's only, you're only choosing based on user experience, yeah, right? Yeah, if there's if there's this is a free app, it's even worse. Yes. Yeah, that's that's kind right? of true. But that's actually what happened okay, on the yeah, App Store. Yeah. As apps kept getting so. Initially, most of the apps were free because it was mostly indie developers making apps. As more and more companies onboarded themselves, it became hard to charge money for apps. And uh, I think there have been large debates around 2010, 2012 on how that is becoming really hard for people to make money yeah. only via selling apps. Yeah. Uh, now, most of the stuff is free. Yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people who never even link up a credit card and can get by for a really long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, user experience defines that in very critical ways, right? Yeah. On what gets downloaded, what doesn't. Uh, yeah. Also, in Apple's case, like in iPhone's case, one good thing was Apple cares about form and function, I think, almost equally. Mm. And, uh, form still follows function, but they do really good on form too. Right? Yes. So that also raised the bar. Like just in terms of the fit and polish that an app should have, um, this was the first time somebody was reviewing apps, literally yeah. putting people there and checking your app if it was good enough for the platform or not. Why does form matter? Why does aesthetics matter? I mean, pe some people call it form. Some people call it aesthetic. Yeah. Some people call it delight. Yeah. We call it delight internally yes. in Gojek. Um, why does it matter? It matters because people are drawn to it. Uh, why? Having an object around you. So I think Dieter Ram said it that good design is aesthetic, right? And he said aesthetics are important because any object, its appearance, it, you know, it influences the well-being of the person who's around it, right? But he also added that no object which is not well executed can be beautiful. Right? Mm. So, yeah, but form is important because we are drawn, drawn to it. There's something called aesthetic usability effect as well, um, which is a UX law, we have very few. Um, which basically says that things that are more aesthetic, they're perceived as more innovative, or they're perceived to have more value mm. than something that is not aesthetically pleasing. I mean, let the, it be that they're both the same in function. The entire right. fashion industry rests upon that premise. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> yes. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure, like, the, the ergonomic value of an additional eight thousand dollars to buy a bag. Is yes. is hard to justify. Yes. So so you know. Yeah. We are, are. Are you saying that we as humans we are fundamentally irrational? We are beings. Yes. And again, uh, we were talking about. Uh, we haven't talked about the other kind of design. You brought up fashion design. Mm. We should talk about graphic design. So mm. we have graphic designers here, guys who pulled off our rebrand. So there are graphic designers who, whose primary obsession is form. Mm. Right. But they also approach it from the point of you know cognitive science. Uh, they can guide your eyes. Uh, they can really make a message stick in people's head. So there's a lot of science and theory behind it. Uh, at the same time, again, um, a good poster uh, for a movie or something else, it, it is sometimes a work of art as well. Like the Swiss masters, what they made, uh, that, that's a great form. Mm. But it always performs the function it is supposed to very well as well. The reason mm. that you remember, say, I remember movie posters of Hitchcock's movies, mm. right? They did a really good job. Like, it's so sticky that it, it's still remembered by people. Mm. But at the same time, it was true to the brief of what the movie poster wanted to communicate and the kind of audience it wanted to get.
So you, form is like we just can't get over form. No, I I think we're fundamentally, you know, wired yeah. to to like certain things based on visual yeah. things, and we don't all like the same things, and that's yes. part of the biggest challenge of being a designer. Yeah. Um, but I think there are the science behind it, and this is where the science starts kicking in. There are definitely um, you cannot the difference is why in, in when we're doing reviews on app designs or product designs or feature level designs um, I hate it when people argue and say you know it's all subjective yeah and and some people may like it and some people may not yeah it's kind of true but there is definitely a right and wrong way to do things yeah. um, and that's the part which is it's partially art a lot of it is science. Yeah. The role of research and iteration and data is extremely important to validate whether you made the right move or yeah. wrong move. Yeah. You know, just to just to catch on to one of the points that you talked about, right? It's impossible to talk about user experience design without research. Yeah, mm. uh, there are uh, there are hundreds of ways that you can do something, and I'm sure there are at least a 99 in which you can go wrong, and Research plays a very critical part in making sure you're making the right thing. Uh, we we have uh, we have had very long debates on where you say that yes, data is important to look at, but it's not a replacement for yeah. talking to your customers. Yeah. You need to go and talk to them, see if the effect that you want to have is the effect that they are having. Mm -hmm. Sure, you should basically look at all the data that you have, use that to the best of your listing to make the right decisions. But sometimes you can't get away from, in fact, most of the times you can't get away from actually talking to your people. Yeah. So, and this happens across, across. I mean, for example, uh, mo most, in, when you talk about design, most of the time people just talk about the consumer side of things. Even when we talk about the merchant side of things, sorry, restaurants, I mm -hmm. mean, that's more easily understood, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, like when we, there was a time when we started planning for figuring out what else do we build on our platform to help merchants grow. We came up with some ideas, things that we could support, something went live. Uh, the next thing that we started off was uh, we conducted, uh, you know, probably the most extensive research in terms of what is it that they want. Mm. Uh, that list had about 50 different solutions. We picked only the biggest one and then we dropped everything else for the next whole year and we build that out um, and the results were phenomenal mm. I mean everything that happened there we surveyed the merchants what they wanted right we actually asked yes, them what yes. they wanted yeah it was a massive exercise and uh, I think when we were starting it seemed like why would you just spend two months trying to do this right mm. but uh, the results have been fantastic we did not touch any of the other 49 things on that sheet in fact it's been a year and now we're looking at it again to figure out can we pick up the second thing or should we just ignore it for now or you think? But uh, we found the one thing that's going to take us home completely. I mean, and specifically if you're talking about product, if you want to make sure that that product hits product market fit, you have to make sure design research is all aligned in terms of what to do and what to make. And you want to make sure you're talking to users before it hits engineering for the first time. So tell me then, if, if the role of design is so important and we're seeing the rise of the status of the designer and, and you know, I think within Gojek, you know, uh, for example, Abinit has direct access to me uh, to be able to say all kinds of recommendations and, and like the Toyota production system, right? Yeah. Um, Abinit will call me and say, this is just unacceptable. Yeah. And I will make that call uh, sometimes I've been able to make that call, but a lot of the times when it requires other functions, then I, I will make that call. So in Gojek, design is slowly becoming uh, uh, a very important and listened to function. Yeah. Maybe still not as much as, it, as we should. Yeah. Um, but then why, why aren't designers product managers? Um, and do, like, why aren't they the lead um, so why, why isn't Abinit the de facto head of product, um, but instead the head of design? Uh, I mean, I, I know you think that, that he's not, 
But you should look at how scared the product managers are when they're like, Abhinit is going to just say no to this man. We can't go ahead with this. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, but you evaded the question, man. So I think, I don't know. Uh, I've worked with some great product managers. Uh, I think uh, there's certain things that product manager is the ultimate balancer. Like they, they keep everybody aligned and they have to know about. So this is funny. Like if you Google product manager Venn diagram, you'll find business technology and design. If you Google product designer Venn diagram, you'll find business technology and design, right? So there is a very strong overlap. But I think on the table, we represent the user, right? And Really? Pro- yeah. I like, thought the product manager is supposed to represent the user. The product That's manager is supposed product. to recommend everyone. Uh, I oh. saw that podcast. I disagreed there. Who's, who, right? So who's outside? Who, who, who else is there? Business. Yeah. You mean like, okay. Business is there. Engineering is there. Right. So I, I'm conflicted about it if designers should take the call there because bias in any direction is not good. You need somebody who's, who can you know, manage biases. But wait a minute. Because yeah. like a, a product success, and I fundamentally believe this, a product mm-hmm. success is its proximity to addressing the needs of the user. Mm-hmm. However you define the needs. You can sure. define the needs in a functional way. You can define yeah. the needs in a... Um, emotional way mm-hmm. or even an aesthetic way, right? Mm-hmm. So, but uh, the closer to the user, the more accurate your understanding of the user, yeah, the but, better. Yeah. So, why wouldn't a designer be the best product managers? Because uh, again, I'm trying to think right now of you know what can be the drawbacks of excessive user bias, right? Mm. Uh, but we are trying to build sustainable business as well, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if you only optimize for user and the business is sacrificed or you don't put that much thought into it, then you do great stuff for five years and then you shut down, mm. right? Uh, take some social media companies example. Uh, their service for the users is free, mm. right? So users have to pay nothing. It's But they get their money from advertisement based off engagement, right? So I think it's designers and product managers and business leaders, engineering leaders, everybody should come together to find the right balance. Mm-hmm. I think if you put, you make designers the captain, excessive user bias might blindside them and you might not get a very sustainable business at the end of the day, right? Okay. So prioritization, I think, yeah, it, it needs a certain balance. And again, um, yeah, I haven't, <laughs> I mean, product I'm management is just not as confused as designers. Not to say yeah. that designers can't be really good they are uh, yeah. product managers. I mean, we have a few mm-hmm. uh, and who do an amazingly good job yes. at it as well. So. Mm. Yeah. I feel like if I had to pick, if I had to force rank the hierarchy in most technology companies, large technology companies, my sense is that product managers are still at the top mm-hmm. of, the, of the hierarchy funnel. I know it doesn't work like this. They're all functional departments. But if I had to force rank, it's still product managers, then engineers, Mm -hmm. then designers, Mm -hmm. then research, then analysts. I mean, this is just a hypothesis on what I've so far felt, but I feel like, you know, it could also be a function of the natural extroversion or introversion (laughs) tendencies of each of these fields. It could also be that, but why, why is, why does, isn't design like, like taking the lead here, you know? Um, or better yet, why isn't research taking the lead? Yeah. Because they know the customer more. I mean, so okay. I think uh, when you think about internal products as well, products are so uh, customers only see very certain number of products from Gojek. There are a lot of internal products which help us do what we do. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I look at food. Do I look at everything from the time that customer makes an order to the time that his food gets delivered? Mm. No. There are a lot of internal products which help me achieve that. Depending on who the customers are for whichever product you're looking at will define who will take a bigger lead in it. Mm. So if you're looking at a marketplace product, you would have data teams have a much bigger handle of what needs to be done or how does it need to be done Mm -hmm. because you don't have a visual component of it at all. When you're looking at, say, food um, or a direct consumer facing product, you would have a very significant involvement of both research as well as design teams. Uh, If you look at, say, growth, some of their pods would need a lot of design help. Some of them would not. Right. So it depends and varies by that, essentially. 
And I think a good product manager knows when there's a feature which is, let's say, primarily about improving the usability of a certain thing. A good product manager, the ones I've worked with at least, they put you in charge. They let the designer lead in mm. those uh, streams. But when it's something, let's say, which is more ops related, then they'd put the researcher in charge. Or when it's something that's about Im you know, improving the usability of an engineering system for the rest of the engineers in the company, they should put a tech lead in charge. So I think that's the role that product manager plays there, knowing mm -hmm. who to let lead at what moment, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the orchestra conductor for these different functions. And I think that is where they're supposed to know a little bit about, about everything. Design's role, um, again, is about, you know, the only thing important about design is how it relates to the user. Yeah. Right. So design's role is just to bring user in every conversation, uh, bring wise and bring knows, uh, especially in you know things like ethical considerations, which are now as AI and ML are rising, that is also responsibility that kind of comes on the designer to ask how can this be used in a bad way, right? Ask that before you design everything because, yeah. I mean, you... Uh, so... Prob yeah. I, I don't know if you interact with most of the designers are frequently, but uh, I think uh, for just most him. of the... Just him, yes. You get a lot of very strong opinions Actually, no, from no, designers. I, I, meet, I meet your one downs yes. during... We used to have those big uh, powwow sessions yes. on design. Yes. yes. And I would like act like you know I knew everything about design pretty convincingly. We yeah. have a thing at Gojek, everyone designs. So everyone yeah. designs. Yeah. Whatever that means, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, so yeah, I mean nothing, nothing major. Like I'm saying, you get the most significant pushback from the consumer side from designers. I mean, we have uh, uh, we have Pratik who's very popular for saying. Uh, so if you ask him, can we do this? He's like, yes, you can do it, but over my dead body. <laughs> <laughs> and but but you have to empower designers to have the audacity and courage to to say these kind of things in your organization. Yeah. I you, think you, it's for everyone on the team. I mean, they're more skilled at us, you know, at this skill set. I mean, the problem with product is you are not the most skilled at anything mm. right, in your team. Yes. Right? Uh, so you'd make sure that if an engineer has really strong opinions or something, I'm sure there is a there's a reason for it. If a designer has very strong opinions or something, there is a very big reason for it. And uh, and I mean, they're the ones who need to take the calls at the end of it. So do you think that? companies or organizations that are very customer obsessed will always prioritize design in the consideration of, 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 of building products. Yes. Is that generally a, a correlation you would agree so, with? So, okay, for example, uh, Amazon started this thing of cons customer obsessed, right? Of talking about it a lot. Right. Their website looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But is the experience amazing? Oh, hell, it is amazing. It's I amazing. mean, you order, I mean, when I moved to Jakarta, the one thing that I miss, missed incredibly uh -huh. was being able to order on Amazon. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. So you don't feel the aesthetic is nice, but yeah. the user experience overall oh, that's amazing. is that amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. Interesting. The speed of getting something to your house, the speed of returning something, all of those were so amazing that the moment I came here, I mean, my wife and I, this was the one thing that we incredibly missed. And okay. Given that, like, the culture that we have, I go to Bangalore for a week a month at least for the last, I don't know, uh, 10 years now. I don't know how long has it been. Uh, so I still end up doing this, that whenever you want to buy something, you order on Amazon, mm -hmm. deliver it to the Bangalore office, go there that month and pick it up. Okay, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, or in those companies who are doing really good customer-focused stuff, like Toyota did, mm -hmm. maybe... There are great designers, they're just not called designers. Mm. But they will value design, for sure. Whether they value designers or not, I think that depends on the designers as well. Mm. You've got to keep speak up. And as I said, uh, design is quite new, right? So we st And there's so many terms that we still keep arguing amongst ourselves about what is design, what's not design. And so what, let's go into the characteristics of what really makes a good designer and or what makes a good design leader. Sure. Right? Because different things. So I'm I'm by no means a designer sure. whatsoever, but I focus on design and user experience a fair amount. It's probably the mo most of the time that's what I get emotional about. Yeah. 
right? I'm, I'm, I, I'm rarely emotional about other things outside of like an unacceptable flow that creates unnecessary work for the user yeah. or um, something that just obviously makes life just more difficult and more painful uh, for the user. Do you think there is something intrinsically uh, built in into into each human, and whether they, is there a natural talent for design, or is this fully learned? Well, uh, well, let me ask you an easier question: Is sure. there a natural talent for aesthetic? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Hmm. Uh, there might be, um, but I think like your taste, what we call taste, taste yes, yeah, it's it's built by everything that you've consumed. Probably it's a sum of all your experiences. Mm -hmm. So it varies. Um, there's a thing like you wouldn't be a very good violin player if you never heard great violin. Like yep. You wouldn't be a great writer. great writer if you haven't read. Well, you wouldn't be a great cook if you haven't eaten great food. Yes. So I don't believe there's a natural angle to it. It's I'm, exposure. Yeah, it's exposure. And I'm an engineer, right? Uh, I think I'd, I'm very bad at drawing or designing with some other medium than software mm. um, and that's because me as an engineer I'm gravitated towards good software I read about it um, I bought the first iPod touch that came out I jailbroke it and I installed every single app that was there mm. and I've been installing every single app for a really long time like whatever Apple and Google feature I install it so that builds my database of what good software is mm -hmm. and I think that's what we call taste so mm. it just requires exposure I don't think there's an innate skill that somebody has that makes them a good designer, or for that matter, anything. Mm -hmm. Like maybe there's some, but I think uh, yeah, it's a skill. It can be taught, can be learned. I mean, you, but uh, the challenge to that statement is, I mean, you, we've we've sparred a lot yeah. on many things. Yes. And the only reason why you are willing to spar with me is because you will only spar with people you respect. Yes. In terms of uh, their both their taste and also their design yes. uh, mindset, yeah. right? So, so you respect me, yes. but I don't like using too many apps. Yeah. In fact, I don't even like using apps. Period. I only yeah. use apps that I absolutely need to use. Yeah. It's just not one of my joys yeah. about using apps. I do it to get something done. I have a function, and then I'm out of it yeah. when I don't need it anymore. Yeah. Uh, outside of like chat right which yeah. is excessive amount of time, a huge amount of my time is spent on there yeah. so i'm not someone who is exposed to too many apps sure. but i have a massive amount of laziness that means that my pain tolerance uh is very very low for yeah. using an app because i want to get yeah. the hell out of there yeah. um as quickly as possible yeah. so how do you how do you reconcile that so design, like there's uh, this thing called the principles of UX. I think Jesse James, that guy from Adaptive Path, uh, design has a lot of layers. There's the surface layer, uh, there's skeleton layer, there's scope, structure, and strategy. Right. So at the bottom most level, it's it's really about why are we doing what we're doing, mm. what does the user get out from it, mm. and then there's the surface layer. So taste is more important in surface, skeleton, and you know scope, that part. Uh, so I wouldn't ask you to design UI. Like mm. we don't spar about, you know, how the navigation is laid out. That's correct. Or we don't spar about is this icon right or colors right or whatever. Eh, we, there's a fair sometimes. amount. It's a yeah. fair amount. So but, okay, but yeah. not as much. You're right. Let's just say on those matters, I ignore you more freely. <laughs> 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 but when it comes to the strategy or the scope of things, uh, when why are we doing what we're doing? Yeah, you in that sense like yeah it's very helpful to mm. spar with you um for surface i would find some designers that i would argue with yes a little more who know a lot about it than i do uh, people who really studied graphic design and really studied you know interaction design interface design mm -hmm. um, but the most important thing is the strategy the most important thing is asking why right and not shying away from it um, i started very young uh so we would land up in these big uh, boardrooms with very senior people. And you, I think when you ask what is the most important thing to you know, lead design somewhere, this is the most important thing. You can't back off. You have to figure out why are these people making what they're making? Mm. What is their motivation? A, for themselves, for their business, and B, for the users. 
right? And that's what you do. You synthesize that into the best solution. But that's step one. You just have to keep asking why. And if uh, there have been some times when we found people reluctant to ask why, or the why turns out to be, you know, we just need to increase the conversions here. Uh, we, we've said no as well, right? Because that's, that's not going to do anything for the user, right? So. Can you share an example of how you said no? <laughs> me? Yeah, you'd probably have better examples for saying no. Um, so I think this is a, so we just talked about this business tech and design, right? Uh, most of the discussions with business teams would be in terms of figuring out how do you get more visibility for something specific in the app, mm. right? Um, the first point that we have to go back and discuss a lot on is what is the exact value proposition for the customer? I understand the value prop for the restaurant. Mm. I understand the value prop for the business. Mm. What is it that we're pitching to the customer? And unless you can put that down on paper and explain to me that this is why, this is the value to the customer, it does not go in there. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll I like give you that. an example of an education app that we did, right? And we were designing something for you know, uh, kids to learn from. And when we discussed with the business team there, uh, it, the, the, the why they wanted to do it was all business reasons. Like we want more subscriptions, we want more engagement, we want more sales. Uh, but I, as a designer, failed to convince them that are the people learning, mm. are they really retaining what they read? Is mm. this actually better than in-class education that they get? Mm. We should have some north star around that. Mm. When we failed, the project kind of tapered off. Mm. Right. So that's uh, kind of an answer. That's that's the most important thing in designing good. Otherwise, you won't be able to design something impactful. That's all. Finally, on talking about hiring yep. great designers. Yep. Hiring and firing great yep. designers. Yes. So if, let's let's start with the negative first. Like, What are your red flags um, in a designer, both in the interview process or maybe while you're interacting with them? What are some of the things where you're like, okay, this guy's got to go? Hmm. Well, Again, in, in leadership roles, uh, you know, hesitance towards, again, the same thing that I said, uh, towards asking counter questions, uh, hesitance towards challenging somebody. Mm -hmm. right. That's in leadership positions, that's a strict no. Um, other than that, again, uh, I don't know. I think uh, inability to explain their work seems yeah. like a big red flag mm. to me. Communication, because, yeah. Uh, for designers, like you said, ev everyone... Explain to non-designers? I mean, no, to even, for example, if some, yeah. if you talk to someone, they should be able to explain why, they, why they're doing what they're doing. Articulate okay. their design Articulating decisions. their design. Yeah, so, okay. for example, uh, a, a lot of times, you would, you would see a final design and your question would be, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And... Everyone is a designer in the sense everyone on the team always thinks they've seen enough UI to be able to comment on design, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, most people don't comment on engineering architectures, yeah. right? <laughs> everyone comments on Because you can't see it, yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's very important for a designer to be able to communicate their thought process of why they think this is the right solution. Yeah. Uh, someone who's really good at creating amazing UIs, which are very simple, but are unable to explain <laughs> why this makes sense. Will always lose out. Oh yes. Nice. Yeah. And they won't they won't be able to assert the customer yes. Yes. priority mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Like one thing is like design, because design is a discipline about making things simple. Um, we I think designers in generally use the plainest language. Mm -hmm. right? they, we have very little jargon. That also makes it hard for us to, you know, communicate at very effectively, like we have to explain a lot of things. Mm. Um, so yeah, articulating your design decisions, not being able to articulate would be a big red flag. Um, then, yeah, uh, again, um, not generating a lot of solutions, like falling in love with your designs, that would be a red flag as well. Falling in love with your designs. Yes. Like, Why is that bad? You Again, the same reason that we discussed earlier, this is not self-expression. Mm -hmm. You're allowed some, mm -hmm. in fact, heaps of it, as long as you don't get in the way of accomplishing what is it, you know, what the user wants to accomplish. 
So that's one mistake. Like designers would. How, how can you tell if someone is in love with their design? What do they usually do? Uh, they like again. It's a very <laughs> so you do a design review and start asking why. It come across as very defensive. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to challenge a brief. What if this happened? What if this happened? Uh, and people would generally give reasons which are not user reasons, right? So putting, you know, there. This is the best solution. They've spent a lot of time there, and they've. Sometimes it happens that other apps have also done this, mm. so that becomes an argument, which is basically yeah. a non-argument, mm -hmm. right? In that it doesn't matter what somebody else has done, uh, because you don't have their data, right? Mm. So that those are generally the signs of a designer being defensive, um, and again, the, just generally the lack of any other option. Mm. Uh, so in design, like there are phases, like we we discover, then we go out, we seek to understand the problem. And then we define the problem, set the goals, agree on why are we making what we're making. Then we diverge, right? So that's the creative part of design, where you use low fidelity means like just pencil, paper, low fidelity wireframes. You design a lot. We make low cost prototypes that we test with people. So in the diverge phase, when you don't see a lot of divergence, yeah, right, that's a red flag as well. Right? It's fascinating. I think yeah. that in the same way that people assume a tech company is innovative because they have brilliant thinkers uh, inside of the yeah. company, yeah. which is completely wrong. <laughs> uh, in innovation is a process. Yes. And in the same way that great design mm -hmm. is considered to be, oh, it's because they have a bunch of brilliant artists yeah. Yeah. in the organization, which is also completely wrong. Yes. It's a process yes. uh, by people collaborating and influencing each other based on one North Star focal point, which is the customer yes. and nobody else. Yes. And that is where great design ultimately comes from. Yes. And you might not make something. Uh, there are designers in teams uh, whose sole job is to facilitate discussions uh, that focus around the customer. And I think that's the ultimate responsibility of a designer to help build an environment that is customer focused, mm -hmm. right? Uh, having them in the team, a good designer would almost always make sure that nobody is having a conversation which is engineering for engineering's sake or building product for just product markets, That's fit's right. sake. Yeah. So if you're, for the listeners out there, if you're running a startup and you do not have a head of design, yeah. you know, and it's a mobile app, <laughs> which most of them are yes. today, um, you better get one. Yes. Real quick. Yes. Um, most founders think they are a great designer. I thought I was until Abhinit came <laughs> and told me how crap my stuff was. And that's when I realized you need designers. All right, guys. Thanks for coming to the podcast. Thanks Hope for Hope to see you lot. again. See sure. you soon. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, Please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.